process. Then you have a flat and slightly oblique uh, laminate and you have a projected square tape process, the transverse process. One peculiarity of the transverse process is that the top is almost a plateau and just beneath that uh, you have an anechoic area. And in most of the cases, it is uh, easy to recognize a small uh, a space in between the fascia ferrector spinae and the transverse process, which is the point of uh, injection of the drug and our area of interest. And when you move more laterally, this uh, square type flat appearance is lost and it becomes almost rounded. And in some cases, you will be able to visualize the junction between the transverse process and the ribs, the costo, uh, uh, the costo transverse joint, which has no relevance uh, for the practical. It's for practical purpose, it is just enough to locate the most lateral part, the tip of the transverse process. No importance to detect the the costal transverse joint. Though, so, though some literature says that uh, it is better, but it is practically difficult and it is not a necessity. So a scanning at T5, a parasitic scanning, it shows the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. You have the trapezius, you have the rhomboids minor or major, depending upon the area you are scanning, and the erector spinae. As I already mentioned, that uh, it contains the dorsal fascia and the ventral fascia, which is uh, hyperechoic and clearly visible and the transverse process and in most cases there is a space and your injection between this space definitely can distend this and create a space at this plane which is uh, very easy and uh, easy to note it out. So this is T7, the rhomboids has already disappeared, the transverse process is there and the, paras the parasitic scan usually is uh, in thoracic areas, it is around 2.5 to 3 centimeters enough to locate the tip of the transverse process. But as you come down, you may reduce the distance from the midline to half a centimeter or so. And the typical appearance of the transverse process, it has got a flat top. And uh, below that flat top, you have that anechoic area and the periosteum is seen as an hyperechoic area. So, why this block has uh, emerged as one of the for, uh, promising for the post pain management? Because uh, the tissue area between the transverse process contains a lot of ligaments, a lot of small muscles. And uh, radiological studies uh, proved that this contains a lot of penetrations. And this is the structure which is uh, forming the posterior boundary of the paravertebral space. So when you deposit your drug, this drug diffuses directly into the paravertebral space and it diffuses laterally to the intercortical space, blocking the lateral branches and the ventral branches. And medially it diffuses into the epidural space. A large volume of uh, 40 ml or so, it has been shown that uh, even the drug diffuses to the opposite side, a slight quantity of drug diffuses to the opposite side. So practically there is a diffusion of the drug into the paravertebral space, the intercostal space, and a small significant quantity to epidural space without having any of its, of its undesired effects of hypertension and all. And second thing, I already told that uh, the layer of muscle is covered by a tough fascia, which does not allow the local to move outside the fascia. So when you deposit your local anesthetic, this drugs based on the volume moves uh, three to four segment cranially and uh, three to four segments cordially. And it is approximately mentioned that uh, 3.5 to ml of the local anesthetic is uh, needed for per segment block. So some 25 to 30 ml of low concentration of the drug definitely will sweep to block uh, six to seven segments. And uh, another important thing is that uh, this drug you are injecting at the tip of the transverse process near to the costal transverse joint. This is the point where all the three nerves 
all the three branches, the dorsal branches, ventral branches, and uh, the communicating branches to the sympathetic system, all fibers will be emerging in different direction, moving it a different direction at this point. So a single injection provides all these branches. So it is just like an epidural, it blocks the sympathetic fibers, the dorsal fiber and the somatic fibers providing a total analgesia. A factor which is uh, very important in providing a total pain-free situation in the post-operative period or in chronic pain condition. It blocks all the fibers. So this is what uh, we have already explained. This is the tip of the transverse process and the beginning of the ribs. Uh, your needle is coming in contact with the tip of the transverse process with the interspace between the erector spinae and the transverse process. And you know that the communicating branch of the sympathetic system, the dorsal ramus and the ventral ramus all are converging and, and, and moving out, diverging from this point. So a single injection provides a total analgesia and through this space, it moves to the intercostal space and medially it moves to the epidural space. This is the anatomic basis of uh, what we have already explained. And it's also electron microscopy proved that this area contains uh, these muscles and small fibrous tissues with a lot of fenestrations. So what are the things? Initially, it was uh, used in, in the management of uh, herpetic neuralgia of uh, thoracic region. But uh, later it found that uh, a block at uh, thoracic, second thoracic level is used for chronic shoulder pain. We have seen that uh, this is uh, useful in, in disease conditions like uh, frozen shoulder. For a block, you can send them for physiotherapy and this block will be long lasting. Repeat block may be necessary, but it will be really helpful. The literature shows uh, it is uh, useful in cervicogenic headache. There are only a few reports, uh, but maybe needing more evaluation. The most studied indication is a block at the mid thoracic level, that's a T5. And the maximum study is occurs in case of a breast surgery and its axillary dissection for the postural pain management. And I think recently we have we, use, we have seen that people using it for thoracotomy where you require a unilateral block. And breast also you require a unilateral block. And uh, we have vast experience uh, using this uh, block in, with catheters for the multiple fracture ribs. And that, that provides immediate total pain relief and reduces the pulmonary complications. And many of the patients on ventilator can be weaned off very fast. And since uh, it relieves the pain immediately from the post-operative period, it uh, reduces chance of uh, chronic pain syndromes. And uh, it's also used in metastatic uh, deposits of the drug with catheters and intermittent blocks uh, re reduces the, the central sensitization of the pain. In breast surgery, it was found that the surgery is done under general anesthesia and uh, this is pro to put to provide positive analgesia. There was a lot of uh, authentic uh, reports that has come recently that uh, there is a definite reduction in the local and uh, systemic metastasis uh, in cancer breast surgery if you put a, a, th a thoracic erector spine. There are a lot of uh, factors that is uh, evaluated for that, including hormonal factors, ingredient vascularity, and uh, better clearance of the tumor cells. Though initially it was uh, used uh, for thoracic, later its application found its way to use in uh, abdominal surgeries. We have vast experience in using it as an exclusive post-op analgesic in major abdominal surgeries like whipple and gastrectomy and uh, resections of the liver, where you require a bilateral block. And uh, nephrectomy also, it does well. Another uh, in chronic pain management, a single shot block may be helpful in unilateral uh, facet arthropathy of uh, spine pathologies and in chronic 
facial myofascial pain syndromes. Lumbar, that is a uh, few reports that has come that uh, it is useful and uh, we have used it uh, for uh, upper lumbar L2 and L1 blocks uh, for uh, hip surgeries and uh, the initial reports uh, were that it is useful. So how do you perform this block and what are the positions in it? If you are giving this block in an unanesthetized patient, a sitting position is more comfortable with uh, keeping all the ergonomics and the comfort of the operator. In this situation, they are giving a needle in the cranial caudal direction. A lateral position is preferred when the patient is anesthetized, uh, being the difficulty in to provide a sitting position and it will be more comfortable. It is a uh, special mention to note that in the same positioning, you can give a bilateral block. It's not at all difficult. We found that uh, a right-handed person, it is, uh, especially when you are going for a cranial caudal needle direction, it is better to put your uh, patient in the right lateral position that gives a better orientation of the needle and the hand. A prone position is uh, especially useful when you are trying for a lumbar erector spine where the muscle is thick and uh, stabilization and visualization will be better. We didn't have much experience on this. Our uh, choice will be on lateral position in anesthetized patient. So how do you perform this block? Initially, you do a transverse scan just to identify the structures, the spine, laminate, transverse process, and uh, the ribs. Later, you starting from the midline, you go for a parasagittal scanning and uh, you locate the tip of the transverse process, 2.5 to 3 centimeters from the midline, just to paraspinal. And your needle is uh, preferable to go in plane. There are few reports where outer plane is, uh, is done, but uh, we find that and many of the reports says that in plane needle is uh, ideal. And another important aspect is that this needle introduction is very shallow, 30 degree. Now or go deeper. And uh, your needle direction should also now be directed towards the medial side because uh, there is a higher chance that it can move on to the intervertebral foramen and can move to the neural axis, which can produce an epidural block. So your needle should be either horizontal or even slight lateral will be fine, but never it should be directed medially, never to be uh, so steep. Initially, you pierce the skin and uh, the subcutaneous tissue and uh, the dorsal fascia of erector spinal that I will show you in the video, then the muscle and the ventral spinal and the ventral fascia and come in contact with the transverse process. After you get the feeling of the touching of the transverse process, you withdraw the needle a millimeter or so and inject a small volume of uh, normal saline, which you call it as a hydrolocation and hydrodissection. This is just to see that your needle is in correct position and you are finding a linear separation in both direction of the erectospinal fascia from the periosteum of the transverse process, which is clearly visible. Then you inject 20 ml of the local anesthetics. And uh, after your initial injection, if, when you stop the injection or when you're aspirating, you find that there is a collapse in the width of the space uh, between this uh, muscle, fascia, and the transverse process, which some people call it as a breathing sign, which is a definitive indication that your needle is in absolutely correct position. So a breathing sign and a linear spread in both direction, lifting the rotor spinal from the transverse process is definite. The single shot blocks, it is uh, found that uh, it may, may not be reliable and uh, you are, uh, there may be some loss of sub-segments in the block. So it's uh, for major uh, pain relief situation, it is better to go for a catheter. You put a two he needle, and introduce the catheter, uh, 18 gauge to he needle and 20 gauge catheter, and you pass the catheter three to five centimeter. One thing that you must specially mention, especially 
be cautious is that uh, the tip of the catheter must be to the vertebral level corresponding to the middle of your incision. This is very important. Then only you can have a spread of the drug in both the direction and get a total analgesia. So this is uh, what uh, we found that uh, uh, this is the erector spinae, the thromboids and the trapezius. And uh, the needle is coming in contact with uh, the transverse process. This is a T5 since you have the three muscles. And your injection produces a lifting, a separation of the erector spinae and the transverse process, which is the definitive thing which can be clearly made. Can I have the video? Binil? Hello? I'll, I'll just try, sir. I'll just try. One second. So we will wait a few minutes uh, till we get the vi video ready. Yeah, one second. I hope you... Are you are able to see the video? No, it's not coming. Yeah, it's coming. Now, now it's coming. It's coming. It's that Can you play it? Yes. It will take a second. It's some uh, five minutes video. I'll be moving it uh, fast. We are doing a transfer scan and you can see that this is, this is the spine and this is the laminae. As you move laterally, this is the spine and this is the laminae. And here you, you know, the spine, laminae and the transverse process all in a line. Then you make your uh, probe in the parasagittal direction. You can see that the posteriorly the pleura slightly takes an early moment and it may not come because the pleura on the posterior lateral aspect is slightly away. So you can see there is a there is a definite margin of safety. And this is that this is the ribs. Ribs when you get a rounded thing. Whereas in the transverse process, it is more of a flat top. This is a flat top. You can see the pleura that is moving. And uh, here is the, the thoracic paravertebral space. A small space you find here is the paravertebral space. Now I oriented my probe uh, in the parasagittal plane. I'll be moving slightly lateral till I get a clear view of the tip of the transverse. And this is the, this is the tip of the transverse process. And this uh, hypoequis area is the erector spinae. This is the dorsal fascia, and this is the ventral fascia. Here at this point, you have the two muscles. At this point, you have the three layers. Okay. So this is a transition between T6 and T7. You can see the clear flat top. This is the dura that is moving, and uh, a small space between the dura and uh, this is the thoracic paravertebral probe. And you can find that how closely the pleura is in thoracic paravertebral block, how we are away in erector spine. The needle is coming, piercing the, the trapezius. This is a video recorded in our case. And it is uh, piercing the rhomboids. And our practice it is just, just piercing the dorsal fascia of erector spinae piercing the erector spinae muscles. And you can either uh, note the position of the needle or you can appreciate by the, the tissue movement uh, when you move your needle. Now I am slightly injecting, I'm injecting a small volume of uh, uh, normal saline, the hydro dissection, I just uh, touching the tip. Just try to pierce the ventral fascia of the erector spinae. And our practice is uh, initially put a single dose, you put a echogenic needle and put a smaller dose of a local anesthetic, then put the to he needle and the catheters because that uh, makes the space uh, more better. You can see the pleura that is moving and this is the flat tip of the transverse process. And here you can see the both the, both the lat seven and six. 
I am injecting the drug. You can see that there's a small space that is created. Uh, bit, th these are the two adjacent transverse process that is created and uh, the fascia is lifted up. This clear space, you can see it's moving in both direction, the cephalic and the caudal direction. As you inject uh, more drugs, it, the spread is more. You can see a clear uh, lifting up of the fascia and your uh, extent of spread uh, directly depends upon the volume of the drug. See that uh, space is uh, clearly created Th and this is the space and as I withdraw the, the, the injection, as I stop the injection, you can see that the space uh, shrinks its, uh, its thickness. This is so what you mentioned as a breathing side, which uh, definitely makes that you are in the correct space. That space created is still there. I am putting the needle once more. The two he needed, we are going at that. We are in the space. You can see that the space uh, just, uh, the needle is just inside the space. We inject some, you see, the drug is lifted up. When you inject into the muscle, you can see something like a white, uh, thick thing, which is will not be there in uh, the, the correct in the space. You can see the breathing side. You are well away from the, the, the pleura. You can see the distance is, is uh, rather good and comfortable for you. It's uh, away from the pleura. So there is uh, no, you can say, a rare chance of uh, pleural puncture. Will I switch off the video? Binil? You can switch off the video, Binil, please. Vinil? Hello? Sir, I, I audible? You can just share the once more the, your presentation, sir. Video is switched off. Yes, yes. So that's fine. Okay. So what are the benefits? When you are doing a quadratus lumbarum block or a thoracic paravertebral block, it is a deeper block with the complications and you need, a, you need a lot of experience in that. But this we found that it's a, something, a technique which can be easily mastered because uh, it's a very superficial block and the structures are clearly visible as we saw in the, in the video. And uh, this is uh, well away, but especially the posterior aspect, the pleura is uh, moving out more anteriorly and uh, there is a very minimal chance of it going into the, the pleura or to the neural axis. And your end point of injection is the clear cut lifting of the fascia from the transverse process and its spread is uh, clearly visible. Once you create that, spa that space, it is easy to put a continuous catheter and uh, this can be used for a wide range of uh, situations uh, from cephalic to the lumbar area. Maybe in the near future, we will get uh, more reports on the, on the use of it in sacral area because there are few in, in the initial reports that is coming. And uh, for surgeries like uh, breast, for abdominal surgeries, uh, if you give a pex block for breast, you are uh, close to the surgical field and surgeon may not like that because that disturbs its uh, surgical plane. But your block is well away from that, including thoracotomies and, sterno and uh, sternotomies of the cardiac surgery. Your surgical, your insertion site is well away from the surgeon and there is no concern uh, for uh, your sharing the same area. Another important uh, point I would like to share is that there is no, I can say there is no significant hemodynamic changes. Just like you put a thoracic epidural, you monitor your patient in the, in the, in the post-operative intensive care units. We have a practice of uh, putting this catheter and giving the drug from the ward. And we used to keep it for uh, five days with excellent energy here. And in most of the situation, except for a night sedation, we don't give any analgesic. And uh, 
another important thing is that when you give epidural, you may have the argument that a lower concentration, you will be make your patient ampullin, but we are not sure. But this patient can be ampullin from the next day without pain, and there is no weakness of the lower limbs. Already mentioned is that it blocks all the three branches, the dorsal, ventral, and sympathetic. So it, it provides an analgesia similar to the epidural. And uh, as uh, from the discussions that we had already, this is applicable only for the post of pain management. I can say in one word that it is not uh, used, though there are a few trial reports that it's used in some surgical, area, surgical uh, anesthesia, but uh, in general, it is an accepted uh, protocol that this is uh, for a post of pain relief or a chronic pain relief. But with one exception that uh, for a superficial surgery of the paraspinal area, just like you are, uh, you are doing a muscle biopsy or you are doing a paraspinal muscle excision, it can be used uh, for surgical anesthesia, but that is very limited. So some tips from my side, the, always the needle is advanced in a, with a shallow angle, now put it deep, there's every chance that you can directly bypass the transverse process and go into the pleura. So always go in shallow, never direct the needle medially, especially when you're putting a catheter, always in the neutral position or a slightly a lateral direction is also fine. In order to avoid wasting of your local anesthetics to locate the needle tip, it's always better to use a non-active fluid like, uh, uh, like uh, normal saline. Your needle tip contact with the transverse process is uh, always recommended and it gives the best results. No need to find out the costal transverse joint and inject into the costal transverse area because our drug very easily diffuses through the costal transverse joint and the intertransverse uh, ligament tissue complexes. So touching the tip of the transverse process and injecting the drug is uh, always that is enough. And uh, the extent of spread that is required for you, you decide on the volume of the drug. If you require larger thing, you give a you give a larger volume. And uh, literature says that even I said that it's a shallow block. You can use a high frequency prop. But we found that a better visualization of the muscle, better visualization of needle, and the catheters uh, is uh, better with a curved uh, low frequency prop. If you ask me that the the why it is, I have no answer. But it's our experience says that it gives a better results and better visualization of both the catheter, both the needles, and the local anesthetic stretch. And the duration of the block uh, of single shot blocks, even you may get to adequate levels, and the duration may be unpredictable. So for major pain relief, you always go for a catheters that gives uh, almost uh, consistent results. And another important thing is that uh, for most of our blocks, we have a practice of uh, uh, giving a continuous infusion, maybe for uh, for uh, our comfort or maybe to reduce the local anesthetic. But this is not the case in most of the interfacial pain blocks. It is better to go for a low concentration in an intermittent bolus because you need a distension of the spaces. We are not uh, locating the nerves and giving the drug, but we are injecting the drug and you have to give a sufficient distension of the, the space to block the nerve. So always uh, it is recommended to go for an intermittent time scheduled bolus. We have a practice of uh, giving the drug uh, 15 to 20 ml every fourth hourly and we use 0.2% uh, ropivacaine uh, for the post of analgesia. Is it uh, as good as uh, thoracic vertebral, paravertebral block? I think yes. And it is uh, not the time to make the comment that it will replace epidural. Maybe we are using it for quite long time and quite familiar with that. But it definitely give an uh, equal results on the thoracic epidural with lesser side effects and a better ambulation 
and uh, prolonged periods uh, for a wide extensive range of pathologies ranging from cervical to uh, the lumbar areas. So this, uh, thank you for your uh, patient listening and giving this opportunity. I may have some shortcomings because I all the, uh, took up this uh, challenge of pre presenting it in hardly less than two hours. If you have any clarification, I'll be happy to clear your doubts. And uh, I thank you all uh, giving this opportunity and giving listening your feedback. Welcome. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Nasser, first for the uh, complete and uh, exhaustive presentation. Uh, you have taken up the challenge. Uh, after 3 p.m., we have decided that uh, Dr. Nasser will be presenting the case. Uh, case. Dr. Sajin, uh, for unforeseen circumstances, he has to back out. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, before going for the questions, uh, I'll I request the national office bearers for the comments. Uh, Dr. Professor Naveed Malhotra is there. He's also interested in pain and doing a lot of uh, blocks and uh, is running a pain clinic also. Professor Naveen Malhotra? His office thing is there. Yes, NHB is there. Yes, sir, is there. Sir, is available. Yeah. Dr. Professor Bhimeshwar was there. Bhimeshwar, sir, is there. Uh, sir, you can un unmute and talk, sir, please. There are a few questions which I will answer after this. Unmute. Sir, BMS, sir, please unmute. Uh, now they will be able to unmute, yeah. Sir, please unmute now. Sir, please, sir, please unmute, unmute now. Unmute and talk. Dr. Nazar, would you like to answer the questions? Yeah, good evening. Good, good evening, everyone. Dr. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Nazar, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, very nicely presented, though, like what you have said in a very short time. That's very nice, sir. Wonderful. I think uh, people will be taking a lot of uh, lessons from what you have said. And I, I'm sure people will uh, be doing these practical uh, uh, blocks regularly. Thank you very much. Hi, Giri Hi, and Benil. Good evening to all of you. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bhimeshwar, Professor Bhimeshwar, and uh, any comments from the senior faculties? I could see Dr. Kiran also. Kiran? Kiran Garu, Professor. Uh, Dr. Nazar, is there a question that is hypotension encountered since uh, synth sympathetics are involved? No. Why? Because uh, here the sympathetic involvement is uh, very minimal and uh, a few segments. So we never encountered any hypertension. We have the practice of monitoring the patient after the initial dose very closely from the theater itself for the initial uh, 20 minutes or so. But afterwards, we never encountered. Uh, that's why we, we kept the practice of setting the patient to the wards, ward on this. We never encountered any problems. And the second thing, there is, a, because sympathetic people, absolutely, I can say that there is no block. Few segments are blocked. We didn't find any, any hypertension. Do you fix the uh, catheter by tunneling? Yeah, that is that, that, that I just forgot to mention. We have always the practice of uh, put, uh, tunneling the catheter for uh, one and a half to two centimeters, uh, very close to the point of exit. That helps to retain it better. And in few cases, we found that there may be a very small leak, but that's not significant. Just put a strong tape and that will take care of it. To what extent of catheter will you, will you be inside? Three to five centimeters. Five centimeters inside, okay. Yes. And uh, there is a question that uh, can we add adjuncts in the local anesthetic? I think uh, there is no need because we never rely on uh, single shot blocks. And since you are giving an intermittent blocks, that is always better. What about in chronic pain conditions uh, where you want uh, to give single shot and uh, break the chain? Rajesh, I didn't hear you. Uh, what about in uh, chronic pain conditions where uh, you want to break the chain by giving a single shot? Yeah, you can give a repeat single shot in that situation. Uh, not, uh, not adding adjuvants. Pardon? Uh, no, no, no need to add adjuvants like steroids. You can add dexamethasone in that situation. Okay. What about continuous block through putting a catheter and uh, 
in continuous instead of intermittent uh, every fourth hour day sir I, i didn't get your question can you please repeat instead of giving fourth hour day can you give continuous uh, through syringe pump or no 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 when you give continuous unlike our bracket fluxes or a sciatic fluxes block when you are continuous you are not producing a distension of the facial okay. plane between the erector spinae and the transverse process okay. because only when you are distending the space that produces spread of the drugs to cephalic cord and it's also mentioned that a definite volume of drug is uh, needed for blocking seven or eight segments so your continuous infusion our produce a pressure inside the spatial plane and they will reduce the movement of the of the local anesthetic in cephala cord direction so it's not at all recommended to go for a continuous infusion sir one uh, sir? how does the patient response when you uh, inject 20 30 ml of volume into the space when you are injecting first time Pardon? what is the response to the of the patient while injecting 20 30 ml of volume into the our practice is uh, we induce a general anesthesia put the catheter and uh, give an initial dose uh, well before the patient is uh, extubated i in 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 fracture ribs and all we found that it takes at least uh, 30 to 40 minutes uh, for the blocks to set in fully that is experience we got from fracture ribs but other patient we put the catheter in advance uh, even before the starting of the surgery uh, doctor nazar do you have any experience of uh, using uh, this technique alone in, uh, other than combining with uh, general anesthesia for pain relief no i have used it only for one condition which i said that uh, it's a paraspinal muscle biopsy there was a, a, a fibrotic swelling at that area and that i did it uh, with a unilateral erector spinae block i never used it for uh, any major surgical procedures just brush or other things never used it and it's not uh, came into a general consensus to use it for uh, such situations there is another question there is any sort of muscle weakness encountered no muscle weakness because our block is confined to the upper thoracic segments only there is no muscle weakness and second thing we are using a very low concentration of ropivacaine 0.2 percentage it doesn't produce a muscle weakness the usual volume for post op pain relief it, it, intermittent volume my practice is uh, if you give it for 15 to 20 ml depending on the weight what is our practice suppose we put a bilateral catheters i give it uh, one side at 8 uh, o'clock for example the other side i give it at 10 o'clock then come back to the same side at 12 o'clock so two sides i never give it simultaneously so both sides will give two minutes two hours apart and give the drug and uh, not uh, in a continuous infusion in a syringe pump pardon and uh, and not in a as a continuous infusion in a syringe pump intermittent no, doses or bolus only for this is not recommended not at all recommended okay thank you the segment uh, that is uh, providing analgesia may be much much less when you go for a continuous uh, infusion there is another question uh, dr nazar can you see it can you I will just see it. accelerate dissection of the breast surgeries can we use uh, can we sir does it uh, cater for access yes, definitely cater for accelerate dissection you just It, uh, it, I give it the same thing. It, it gives analgesia for axillary breast dissection. And uh, for your axillary dissection, maybe pex block alone. I don't know whether it will be sufficient, but this this will do. Unilateral block uh, take care of the axillary dissection also. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there is a question was... regarding the pediatrics. How is the dose and what? I don't have any experience in doing it uh, for pediatrics. My experience is uh, only for the adult. But when you calculate on weight per basis, uh, it never exceeds. Especially when you are using Rofin, you will be hardly giving one third of the total dose that can be given. Okay. Uh, so there is another question: uh, use of block in the anticoagulated patient. That's that, that's a debate uh, that is coming up. 
there are uh, different views and different thoughts on that. The American society says that it's a superficial block. Uh, you are doing it under ultrasound and you are a visualizing structures. There is no major vessel. It can be given. But uh, European society has little hesitation in uh, giving it block for in anticoagulated patients. But I personally feel that uh, as a single anticoagulated patients, it can be very, very given. Even in person safety, your anatomy is clearly visible. That can be given. Okay, if there is uh, no more questions, we'll go to the second session. But uh, before that, the announcements for the next week's program, uh, we have basic physiology class by uh, Professor Balabaskar, that is basics of local anesthesia and how it acts at the molecular level. And uh, a little bit of uh, local anesthetic pharmacology also that will be useful for the postgraduates preparing for the practical exams. Then the another important session is that anesthesia for hypec, uh, intraperitoneal insufflation of uh, hypothermic intraperitoneal insufflation of chemotherapeutic agents. So that will be done by Professor Rakesh Garg. Uh, he's, uh, he's an additional professor in the division of Onco Anesthesia at Ames, New Delhi. Over to Dr. Vijesh for the next session. Dr. Vijesh. Dr. Vijish, please unmute. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rajesh, and good evening, dear friends. We move on to the... Uh, yeah, okay. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah you are audible. Hello. You are audible. Okay, good evening, all, and thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, we move on to the next session, that is on inotropes and vasopressors. And for that, we have with us uh, Dr. Anuraj VT, who is the Associate Professor at the Department of Anesthesiology, Government Medical College, Kotte. Over to Dr. Anuraj. Uh, good evening, all. Am I audible? Yeah, audible. Yeah. Okay, audible. good evening, uh, the organizers of ISA, uh, my dear seniors, uh, teachers, as well as uh, my dear students. Uh, very good evening to you all. Uh, First, uh, let me thank all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this topic for you. The topic uh, given to me for uh, presentation is uh, inotropes as well as vasopressors. Uh, it's a very uh, age-old discussion, but still uh, re relevant for the our uh, video operative practice as well as uh, for the exam purpose. Also. I'll share my slides. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yeah, it's visible, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. As we all know, intraoperative hemodynamic fluctuations are very common in our anesthesia practice as well as in the uh, critical care practice because uh, we all know most of the patients admitted to our ICU are uh, critical patients. So, uh, hemodynamic fluctuations, especially hypertension, is very common in our ICU patients. So we will uh, chat uh, before going to the uh, topic of uh, inotropes as well as vasopressors. Uh, let me have a uh, short, give you a short discussion about uh, the hemodynamic shock. It's actually a clinical syndrome resulting from uh, inadequate tissue perfusion, uh, which results in an imbalance between tissue oxygen supply as well as uh, demand. I would like to tell you something uh, the opposite effect because that's uh, shock is not just hypotension. It's actually the hypoperfusion of the organs. That means the normal tensile patients can be in shock. If the, the, that, that means the patient is not showing any features of, uh, uh, features of hypotension, then you should probably recheck the uh, BP. And uh, the signs of uh, hypotension include tachycardia, relative hypotension, tachypnea, cold and clammy extremities, urea, dyslysemia, delirium. All these should be checked uh, 
when you are evaluating a patient uh, who is suspected uh, suspect of being in shock. So, so different types of shock we all know. These are the hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, uh, distributive shock, um, and the obstructive shock. These are the main four different types of shock. And the important uh, hemodynamic parameters associated with the, these types of shock we all know. As in um, uh, hypo, we know hypovolemic shock, the CVP will be low and uh, uh, the SVR will be high and the cardiac output will be obviously low. In cardiogenic shock, the main uh, hemodynamic parameter that is affected is the cardiogenic, is the cardiac output with an increase in uh, SVR. And in uh, uh, distributed type of shock, the most important examples in low sepsis as well as anaphylaxis, the most important pathophysiology, the pathophysiological change that is observed is a reduction in the SVR. And in neurogenic shock, similarly, SVR is affected. In obstetric kind of shock, the examples of which include uh, cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorides, and massive pulmonary embolism, uh, the, cardiac, the cardiac output is low, the CVP is elevated, pulmonary active occlusion pressure is elevated, as well as the SVR is elevated. This is in brief about the different kinds of uh, uh, shock that we uh, encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. So in general, how do you manage this shock? Is the management should proceed in our usual line for the, uh, the first, the, the airway, airway breathing should be uh, assessed and uh, airway, we need to check whether the airway needs to be secured. And you should check whether there are any immediate correctable causes that should be addressed at first, like uh, um, any cardiac tamponade or uh, any pneumothorides or any uh, hypovolemic shock that should be uh, incorrectable causes should be looked into and should be corrected the earliest. And so simultaneously, we should uh, ensure that we are uh, ensure perfusion to the vital organs uh, and we should give a volume resuscitation as well as here comes the importance of vasopressors and cyanotropes. We come to the, our topic proper, that is cyanotropes as well as vasopressors. So, for going to the um, pharmacology of cyanotropes as well as, well as vasopressors, we all know cardiac output is equal to, it's a, it's a product of heart rate as well as stroke volume. And the stroke volume is affected by three factors, that is the preload and the contractility as well as the afterload. These factors influence the stroke volume and the cardiac output is the product of heart rate as well as the stroke volume. And the blood pressure is not synonymous to cardiac output. Blood pressure is actually for, is a product of cardiac output as well as SPR. So if you increase the SPR or if you increase the cardiac output, you can uh, increase the PP. So the ultimate question comes, what is an anotrop in the vast part of us? Most of us will be knowing, for, but for the completion's sake, let me tell you, anotrop increases the contractility of the heart, thereby increasing the, thereby increasing the cardiac output. And vasopressor causes vasoconstriction, constriction of the blood vessels, both uh, systemic veins as well as the arteries, and it will increase the mean arterial pressure. So the next comes, question comes, is there any pure vaso vasopressor or a pure inotropic? Actually, this uh, uh, inotropic action and the vasopressor action, these actions are actually dose dependent and receptor dependent. So these are all actually depends upon pre predominantly the dosage. So you can see here, uh, there are only two uh, pure vasoconstrictors, that is phenylephrine as well as the vasopressin. Uh, These are only pure vasoconstrictors. All others have got combination of reactions, like uh, if you can see the noradrenaline, epinephrine, dobutamine, they have got both inotropic action as well as the vasoconstrictive action. And the inodilators include dobutamine as well as mildrenone. These are the inodilators. Only phenyl we have got the phenylephrine as well as the vasopressin. These are the pure vasopressors. All others have got a combined action. So how will you classify the cyanotropes as well as vasopressors? So first of all, let me tell you that there is no widespread accepted classification of the cyanotropes as well as the vasopressors. There are so many classifications put forward, but none of them are perfect. This classification should correlate with our uh, clinical actions. So uh, these classifications uh, are not uh, perfect. So one of the classifications is like this. For instance, the drugs are classified into sympathomimetic. Sympathomimetic drugs are those drugs which either mimic or it stimulates the action of it, it uh, enhances the action of the endogenous catabolism. They are uh, broadly divided into agents with a direct action, indirect action, as well as mixed action. And another group of drugs, and vasopressor, is the vasopressor receptor antagonist. That include vasopressin as well as terlipressin. And another group is phosphodiesterase inhibitors like uh, mildrenone, enamrenone. And the fourth one is calcium sensitase like 
synthesizers like alibosim and we'll come to the pharmacology of each one of the each one of these drugs first of let so for uh, let's see what is direct as well as direct, what is indirect action uh, what what is direct action is we can here we can see direct action by direct action means they will directly stimulate the uh, receptors we can uh, we can see here they, are, they, are, they, they will directly stimulate the uh, alpha as well as uh, beta receptors this is the alpha as well as beta so they will directly stimulate the alpha as well as the beta receptors but the indirect drugs uh, acting drugs will do is that they will cause the release of this endogenous uh, norepinephrine which then stimulate the receptors that is known as indirect so direct means they directly stimulate the receptors and the indirect means they will release for the release of endogenous norepinephrine which will stimulate the receptors or they can prevent the reuptake of norepinephrine also which will also uh, cause a stimulation of this receptor there are certain drugs which have got the actions of both both which have got both the direct as well as indirect action examples for this uh, directly acting drugs include adrenaline noradrenaline isoprenaline and phenylephrine this that's directly act on the receptors whereas indirectly acting drugs include cocaine and the amphetamine and uh, certain drugs have got both the direct action as well as indirect action and that include ephedrine as well as phenylephrine and there is another classification for this sympathomimetic drugs this uh, i think this is also important for uh, the exam point of view that is uh, classification into catecholamines as well as non catecholamines and the catecholamines are again divided into natural catecholamines and synthetic catecholamines natural catecholamines examples we all know is adrenaline noradrenaline and dopamine and synthetic catecholamines include isoprenaline dobutamine and dopamine there are certain non catecholamines are also there which are also useful to us such as uh, ephedrine phenylephrine methoxamine and uh, uh, acting by non direct mechanism so like phosphodiesterase inhibitors and others like vasopressin so uh, let uh, let's briefly go through the catecholamine synthesis catecholamine synthesis directly starts from uh, tyrosine as you can see in the diagram it starts from tyrosine and then it's converted to, uh, into uh, by tyrosine hydroxylase into dopa l dopa l dopa is acted upon by Uh, dopa decarboxylase to dopamine dopamine decarboxylase is acted upon by dopamine beta hydroxylase to norepinephrine norepinephrine is converted to epinephrine by phenyl ethanolamine and methyl transferase so the diagram so the this uh, is complete synthesis of uh, catecholamines starting from tyrosine then to dopa dopamine noradrenaline and finally to adrenaline now how is it metabolized metabolism is actually complicated so many enzymes are involved in this pathway of uh, uh, metabolic pathway of uh, catecholamines uh, but you have to under, understand only one thing this is uh, you, uh, the norepinephrine uh, this is norep uh, norepinephrine you can see norepinephrine is converted to uh, norepinephrine is uh, mm, norepinephrine you can see norepinephrine over norepinephrine norep is converted to uh, normethanephrine and normethanephrine is converted to vinyl mandelic acid by two enzymes this these two enzymes are most important for the catabolism of uh, 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 catecholamine one is this is uh, actually written wrongly it's monoamine oxidase mao mao monoamine oxidase and this one is catechol o methyl transferase norepinephrine nor epinephrine is converted to normethanephrine by the action of this uh, monoamine oxidase as well as catechol o methyl transferase and normethanephrine is again converted to vinyl mandelic acid whereas epinephrine is converted to metanephrine by uh, catechol o methyl transferase this is the fate of noradrenaline as well as epinephrine whereas uh, dopamine is converted to uh, an intermediary uh, compound intermediary compound by mono mono uh, mono i mean oxidase and then it, again it's acted upon by catechol o methyl transferase to form a vanillic acid so this is the catabolism briefly the catabol catabolism of uh, uh, catecholamine now we come to the adrenergic agents the most important uh, receptors act upon by the catecholamines responsible for the action of catecholamines is the adrenergic receptors as we all know these are there are two types of broadly there are two types of uh, receptors one is an alpha receptor and another one is a beta receptor these are uh, g protein coupled receptors and uh, they are again broadly divided into alpha 1 and alpha 2 and beta is again divided into beta 1 beta 2 and beta 3 beta 3 is of little significance to us so we will be discussing only about alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 and beta 2 uh, 
and uh, you can uh, you have you have to and you have to understand one thing: uh, the action of the, the action of stimulating these receptors are very important, and you have to know about the actions of uh, the responses of the stimulus response that we get by stimulating these receptors. So, what about uh, the action of uh, the stimulating? Uh, what about the uh, the action that 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 is obtained by stimulating the alpha one receptor? So, when you stimulate the alpha one receptor, it's present the vascular smooth muscle. And when you stimulate the alpha one receptor, you get the uh, vaso you get the vaso constriction, intense vaso constriction. And the alpha two receptors they are present uh, throughout the CN. And when stimulated, you will get a similar like response. You can uh, remember by uh, thinking about the actions of clonidine, uh, sedation, and analgesia, and the attenuation of sympathetic immediate response. Beta one receptors are uh, widely present in the heart, and it uh, it's associated with a positive inotropic as well as a chronotropic effect. And beta two is present mainly in the all the smooth muscles, including the bronchi muscles, smooth muscles are used to press like relating to relaxation of the smooth muscles. This chart we have to buy up anyway. As effect of uh, stimulating alpha one, alpha two, beta one, and beta two receptors. And the side effects of this catecholamines can also be uh, guessed or uh, can be assumed by by um, by learning about the actions of stimulating the receptors. Uh, alpha one, alpha one stimulation. Uh, will lead to vaso will lead to vaso constriction. So the side effects include hypertension, and it can also cause ischemia as well as necrosis of the uh, fingers as well as the toes. Uh, it's made, it's made gangrene can also, can also cause urinary tension. Stimulation of alpha two leads to CNS depression, respiratory depression, bradycardia, hypertension because of the sympathetic effect. It can cause hypertension, bradycardia, and rebound hypertension is also frequently seen in uh, alpha two agonistic effects. Beta one stimulation is commonly associated with the tachycardia and arrhythmia. And it can precipitate angina and uh, myocardial infection by intense cardiac stimulation. If beta one stimulation will produce both increased dynotropy as well as chronotropy, that will produce tachycardia and arrhythmia and can precipitate myocardial ischemia infection. So beta two stimulation can produce uh, tremor, agitation, insomnia, diaphoresis, hypotension, reflex tachycardia, and all sorts of metabolic complications that will come to it uh, about it later. Uh, so these are the uh, adverse effects based on uh, receptor action. Okay, now we'll come to individual drugs. Uh, first and foremost, important the prototype of uh, adalpha catecholamines is uh, adrenaline, and it's a it's a naturally as we all know it's a naturally occurring catecholamine neurotransmitter. It's a non-selective uh, adrenergic receptor. It acts on alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, and the beta three. It's a non-selective adrenergic agonist, and it's available uh, in ampules containing uh, one milligram, one milligram per ml ampules containing clear and colorless solution. Uh, one thousand dilution in amber colored bottles. Uh, it's, uh, it's, the amber colored bottle is not to protect it from sunlight. Sunlight exposure will lead to photo degradation. The different routes of administration include IV bolus, IV infusion, IEM subcutaneous, intravenous, and so many uh, routes of administration are possible with the adrenaline. And an antioxidant, sodium metabisulfate, is uh, um, uh, added to prevent oxidation. This is a very important sodium metabisulfate. This bisulfate is added to prevent oxidation of uh, adrenaline. This is the basic structure of uh, uh, catecholamines, as you can see here. Uh, this is uh, this is known as uh, this this part is known as the catechol catechol ring catechol part. This is actually a benzene a benzene ring with a two hydroxyl group. And uh, this is uh, this is this structure is known as uh, catechol. This structure is known as and catechol. And here is attached uh, an amine group, catechol amine. So we call it as catechol amine. This is the structure of uh, adrenaline. So what are the what are the effects of what are the serious effects of adrenaline? Serious effects effects of adrenaline starts depends upon the receptor uh, on which the adrenaline acts like. Uh, it has got intense uh, action on alpha one, alpha two, beta one, and beta two receptors. Action on beta one, beta one receptors lead to increase in cardiac contractility as well as increase in heart rate. And uh, actions on uh, alpha alpha one, it will cause vasoconstriction, diffuse vasoconstriction, all systemic arteries as well as the vein. There is a peculiarity in the uh, action on BP by adrenaline. In low doses, uh, as you can uh, see in the next uh, the, uh, uh, diagram, you can see. You can see here uh, in low doses, uh, but uh, well, the, the, the beta two stimulation will predominate. In higher doses, alpha action will uh, stimulate. Alpha action will predominate. 
So when you're giving adrenaline, what will happen is that initially there will be uh, an increase in the BP. It will be followed after some time, the, the concentration of adrenaline will fall and it will be followed by drop in blood pressure. Uh, this is seen in, uh, uh, this is because at low, low doses, uh, beta 2 action will stimulate and at the higher doses, alpha action will uh, predominate. So vasodilatation at low doses and the vasoconstriction and the increase in BP at higher doses can occur. Overall, a low to moderate doses of adrenaline will increase the cardiac output and there will be only a moderate a small changes in mean arterial because of the system vasodilatation due to beta 2. At higher concentrations, the alpha uh, effects will predominate over the beta 2, leading to systemic vasoconstriction and increase in the mean arterial pressure. This is about the actions of adrenaline on the cardiovascular system. Briefly. And about uh, uh, the respiratory system, effects on the respiratory system, adrenaline produces a, a small increase in the minute ventilation, and it has got, because of the action on beta 2, it has got a proton uh, bronchodilatory effects. The pulmonary vascular resistance is increased. It also leads to inhibition of the antigen induced release of inflammatory mediators, and the bronchial secretions are reduced, and the condition of the mucosa is alleviated. And uh, these, two, uh, these two actions are very important because. Uh, these two actions, these two actions, the last, the final two actions are very important because uh, it makes adrenaline. Uh, uh, this it contributes to the action of adrenaline uh, anaphylactic uh, shock. Then uh, other metabolic actions uh, include uh, it is associated with the uh, hyperglycemia as well as hyperlactatemia. These are the these metabolic actions are very much predominant with the uh, adrenaline. This increases the concentration of adrenaline, increases the concentration of uh, blood glucose, as well as increases the concentration of lactate. The mechanism behind the hyperglycemia in good in, 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 inhibits insulin secretion. It has got both the actions, like it, it can stimulate insulin secretion as well as it can inhibit the secretion. But usually, the it's inhibiting the insulin secretion will predominate over stimulation of insulin secretion. Also, to decrease the uptake of glucose uh, by the peripheral tissue, it can stimulate the glycogen glycemia. And it also increases the concentration of lactate by stimulating the uh, skeletal muscle aerobic uh, lactate production. And it increases the concentration of free fatty acids in the blood. And in the eyes, it can lead to mitriasis, reduce the production of active tumor. And that's why it's useful in the uh, treatment of glaucoma. It also promotes a fall in plasma potassium hypokalemia by uh, enhancing the uptake of potassium into the cells. These are the metabolic actions of adrenaline. About the pharmacokinetics, uh, as with any other catecholamine, any other catecholamine, it's not absorbed orally, and uh, the subcutaneous absorption is lower when compared to uh, IM absorption. Previously, we used to give adrenaline to the subcutaneous route, but uh, we now know that the subcutaneous subcutaneous when you give adrenaline to the subcutaneous route, this absorption is going to be slow, and it's more rapid when you give it to the IM route. That's why in anaphylactic shock, anaphylactic shock, we give the, we give adrenaline to the IM route. And IM is given only in emergencies, uh, taking into consideration about the different adverse effects associated with the action of the use of adrenaline. And uh, the other routes include nebulization. Uh, still, arrhythmia can occur even if you give through the nebulization route. And interosseous route in, in emergencies, if when you get, don't get any IV line for emergency use, you can give uh, interosseous route. But the dose requirement is uh, higher than compared to the IV route. What about the metabolism? Metabolism is uh, like any other catecholamines. Uh, it's metabolized in the liver by COMP as well as the monoamino state. It is uh, unstable in alkaline uh, solutions. Uh, you have to consider this point also. Uh, this is unstable uh, unstable in alkaline solutions. That's why you don't you should not mix it with uh, soda bicarbonate. We don't actually mix it with soda bicarbonate, but we sometimes we uh, we administer adrenaline. Along, along with the um, soda line, so, 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 soda by term, to the same uh, same catheter or same camera. That should be avoided because it's highly unstable in alkaline solutions. And when exposed to air, this point is very uh, important. Uh, you might have noticed I have, I have changed the font here. This is because this is very important for your exam purpose. For some point of view, we can ask you when you do your viva examination. When exposed to the light, this liquid at first it will turn to pink because of the oxidation to adrenochrome and then, then, then to brown because of the formation of melanin. And the uses, uh, there are so many uses of fentanyl. Uh, most of them are uh, outdated uh, nowadays. More uh, safer drugs have come into play. Uh, but uh, for the exam point of view, you have to know about the very different uses of fentanyl. And you can 
uses mnemonic uh, for the for remembering the for, for keeping in mind about the uses of that A for anaphylactic shock and B for uh, bronchial asthma. A for an A for an A for anaphylactic shock, B for bronchial asthma, as well as for uh, the treatment of symptomatic bradycardia. Then C for uh, cardiac arrest, D for uh, delayed uh, delaying the absorption of local delaying the absorption of uh, uh, local anesthetics. And uh, then uh, E for uh, control of epistaxis as well as uh, elevation of BP during hypotensive state and glaucoma. So, so, so first, first of all, let's consider the action of cardiac arrest. The, so I have also put this uh, in a separate form because it's also frequently asked in your, asked in your exams why adrenal insufficient cardiac Adrenal causes intense stimulation of the alpha interceptors in the vascular smooth muscles, will cause vascular constriction and uh, this will increase the aortic highest speed. We can see in the diagram, uh, you can see uh, in the diagram, uh, this is uh, alpha constriction, uh, this, is, this is alpha constriction, it will, it will uh, cause, it will increase the system vascular resistance and it will increase the uh, I have the root diastolic pressure. It will increase the coronary perfusion pressure uh, as well as it will increase the cerebral perfusion pressure. This coronary perfusion pressure is strongly associated with the return of spontaneous circulation. And the dose of fentanyl is 1 milligram and intravenous or intravenous every 3 to 5 minutes. It's included in the uh, heart rotation CPR guidelines. Uh, but the long term effect, the long term survival with the uh, adrenaline is uh, not proven. What about the use of adrenaline? Uh, use of what about the use of adrenaline and anaphylactic shock? The mechanism behind the use of uh, 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 adrenaline and anaphylactic shock is because it is a, a strong, a strong vasoconstrictor. It will counteract the vasodilatation as well as increase in permeability. This is these are the reasons for the high for the occurrence of hypotension in anaphylactic shock. This vasodilatation as well as increased vascular permeability, this increased vascular permeability will cause leakage of fluid from intravascular space, leading to uh, uh, Reduction in the intravascular fluid volume. These are the two risk factors. For the, these are the two factors that contribute to hypotension and aphylactic shock. Uh, Adrenaline being a strong vasoconstrictor, it will uh, counteract um, will counteract the, the vasodilation as well as increase vascular permeability. Also, adrenaline stimulates the bronchial beta two receptors, which will cause stronger dilatation. Also, adrenaline alleviates pruritus, uh, arterial angioedema, uh, and will provide symptomatic relief. So, with these three mechanisms. Uh, are the reasons for which uh, we prefer adrenal as the vasopressor uh, or other drug of choice in an athletic shock. It's also a physiological and a boost of uh, histamine and it will reduce the mass of the Root is IM. You should not get confused. Recent studies, and every, uh, uh, every uh, recommendation, every, every, uh, every guidelines, they recommend the root as the IM, not subcutaneous root, because subcutaneous root is associated with the delayed in absorption and the reduced effect when compared to IM group. Those is 0.5 milligram of, that is 0.5 ml of 1 in 1000 solution. And uh, site is antral aspect, uh, antral aspect of middle third of the site. It should be chosen when you are giving adrenal to the IM group. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, this dose is, uh, use, this dose is preferred for uh, adults only. And uh, this uh, dose is preferred for adults and for pediatric, the dose may change like the 0.3, 0.15, the dose will change. And other uses of adrenaline, uh, adrenaline is used in low cardiac output state when it's unresponsive to other ionotropic agents. And the dose is uh, 0 0.15, 0.01 to 0 0.0, 0.5 mics per kg per month. Those you have to remember. This is the dose of uh, adrenaline for uh, um, ionotropic support. Uh, when uh, low cardiac output states like uh, uh, positive ABG, when it is unresponsive to other ionotropic agents, you can add uh, adrenaline. And uh, uh, in our anesthesia practice, we use it as an ad additive in local anesthetic agent, reduces systemic absorption of adrenaline, uh, dilution is 1 in 2 lakh, then the open angle glaucoma as a 1% of thermic solution. Also, uh, historically, uh, it has been used to treat acute airway obstruction as a nebulization. Different adverse effects of adrenaline should be kept in mind. This is the main reason why we don't uh, routinely use adrenaline. That is, the uh, most common side effects include restlessness, tremor, palpitations. Hypertension, severe hypertension is lost to cause birth of the hemorrhage. Different kinds of adrenaline, all kinds of adrenaline can be prevented by adrenaline. And the uh, uh, most common one would include uh, ventricular arrhythmia. Also, by increasing the myocardial oxygen demand, it can precipitate anterior infection of the CAD. Also, there are a lot of metabolic side effects which are uh, specific for, not specific, but are more common with the adrenaline. 
it's contraindicated in patients with non selective beta blockers because uh, it can get the hypertension because of unopposed action of the uh, alpha action. Next, uh, this is about adrenaline. So, next we will uh, deal with uh, uh, noradrenaline. Noradrenaline, as you know, is equally important as adrenaline, the most commonly used catecholamine in our. Um, in our in our ICU. It's a naturally occurring catecholamine. It's a neurotransmitter also. Main action is on uh, alpha 1 and it's with the minor action on beta 1. As you can remember, we have already discussed with adrenaline, adrenaline acts on all the receptors, um, uh, all the receptors of um, all the adrenaline receptors that is alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, and beta 2, and beta 3. Whereas uh, noradrenaline, the main action is on alpha 1. It causes intense sympathetic vascular with a minor action on uh, beta 1. There is no action on beta 2. Because of the beta 2, you can remember, because of the action on the beta 2, adrenaline is associated with hypertension. There is no action on beta 2 by noradrenaline. And it's available as ampules containing clear solutions of noradrenaline by tartrate. It can be given as IV infusions only, to contrary, uh, when compared to adrenaline, where multiple groups of administration are possible for adrenaline. Noradrenaline, IV infusion is only possible. And it also contains a preservative sodium metabisulfate and it's uh, acidic to prevent the degradation by the alkaline and environment. Actions include in, in actions in uh, uh, CVS including supporting also consumption as I've also have already told you. It's a um, uh, it's a uh, you can see it's a potent alpha one uh, it's a potent, a potent alpha one uh, stimulant so that can lead to potent vasoconstriction it will increase both systolic as well as the diastolic BP. This is the most important action of the norepinephrine, increasing the both systolic as well as diastolic BP. And at the same time, it is likely to activate the bioreceptor system, leading to similar stimulation of the vagal reflexes, leading to, leading to bradycardia. So initially, when you give an IV, initially the heart rate is increased. Sometimes the heart rate can drop uh, simultaneously reducing the cardiac output. Cardiac output is usually unchanged or sometimes it is decreased. It is associated with the reduction of blood flow to the kidney, liver, and the all those planning systems, skeletal muscle, the liver, blood flow is decreased because it is actually a vasoconstrictor. Vaso it, uh, it actually squeezes the blood vessels. It reduces the blood flow to all the organs, including uh, kidney, liver, as well as uh, uh, all, all this planning uh, uh, perfusion is reduced. But the global filtration rates are usually maintained. But uh, noradrenaline may, may increase the coronary blood flow. And uh, uh, in contrary to, uh, in, in comparison to uh, adrenaline, there are no significant metabolic effects. And the dose is uh, some similar to adrenaline, that is 0 0.05 to 0.5 mics per kg per minute. And uh, the main use of adrenaline is as all of uh, you know, it's the vasopressor of uh, choice in, uh, in uh, vasopressor of choice in, in uh, septic shock. The main adverse effect, intense vasoconstriction of adrenaline with organ ischemia and muscular necrosis with uh, bond for uh, So sometimes you may be asked to compare the effects of adrenaline with the noradrenaline in your bio uh, You can see here, uh, uh, the first, 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 uh, this, uh, the, the, both of both of this, uh, both this adrenaline as well as noradrenaline. Uh, they are um, catecholamines, they are directly acting as catecholamines. They are similar in uh, structure as well as action. Uh, and uh, the adrenaline as well as uh, noradrenaline actually differs in uh, differs only slightly. Uh, as, uh, as, uh, I told you, uh, as, as I told you before, there is a slight, uh, there's only a slight uh, difference in the structure of uh, adrenaline as well as noradrenaline. Uh, this is um, this is a, a benzene ring, and uh, this is this is the basic structure of uh, dopamine. Uh, it's a benzene ring with uh, two hydroxyl groups, and uh, we are attaching an amide group here. This is the basic structure of uh, dopamine. When you attach an hydroxyl group here, you will get noradrenaline, and when you attach a methyl group here, a methyl group here, you will get adrenaline. So this is the structure of adrenaline. So these are structurally related. Uh, and about the receptors, you, you, can, you know, uh, adrenaline acts on all the receptors with non-selective adrenergic receptor agonists, whereas uh, noradrenaline acts predominantly over the alpha-1 receptors with the minor action on alpha-1, sorry, beta-1, and uh, with no action on beta-2. Roots of administration, all kinds of roots of administration are possible with the adrenaline, whereas uh, uh, with noradrenaline, uh, we can, you can give on 
many years on IV infusion. Effect on heart is a powerful adrenaline, it's a powerful uh, cardiac stimulant, it increases the heart, it increases the um, stroke, it increases the force of contraction. Whereas it's also a cardiac stimulant, but sometimes uh, uh, less cardiac cardiac can also with uh, but it's not so free. BP, BP is good to a biphasic action. Uh, when you give adrenaline, initially you get the increase in BP as well as cholesterol BP, followed by a reduction uh, BP. No, that's known as a biphasic, the biphasic action of adrenaline. Whereas no biphasic action is seen with no adrenaline, only as intense vasoconstriction as well as increase in cholesterol BP as well as cholesterol BP is with no adrenaline. And metabolic actions are very common with the noradrenaline. And uh, metabolic actions are uh, rarely seen or not at all seen with, not seen with, uh, commonly seen with noradrenaline. It's a, uh, an adrenaline is a powerful bronchodirect, whereas noradrenaline, there is no bronchodirect action. Now comes to the uh, dopamine, another commonly used uh, catecholamine uh, is the dopamine. It's an immediate precursor of noradrenaline, as you can uh, remember. Uh, the pathway of uh, catabolism synthesis is tyrosine, tyrosine to dopa to dopamine, dopamine to noradrenaline, noradrenaline to adrenaline. So it's the immediate precursor of noradrenaline. It can act as a neurotransmitter in the central system as well as as, uh, as a hormone in the system of circulation. Uh, when compared to the other adrenaline as well as noradrenaline, uh, it stimulates dopaminergic as well as the uh, dopaminergic as well as the adrenaline receptors, both directly as well as indirectly. It's available in the 5 ml ambules containing 40 mg per ml and it's not effective orally and does not cross the uh, blood brain barrier. This is a spectrum of, uh, we have mentioned previously, this is a spectrum of dopamine. So, what are the cardiac uh, serious actions of dopamine? It's known to all. It's a, the dopamine receptor action, it acts on multiple receptors, dopamine receptors, uh, dopamine receptors as well as the uh, adrenergic receptors. And the separate actions are uh, separate actions are actually uh, dose dependent. In low dose, that is three to five mics per kg per minute. It's actually microgram. This is, this is given as mic, given in microgram per microgram per kg. It acts on dopamine receptors, leading to increase in dopamine receptors are mainly uh, found on the renal blood vessels. Uh, it leads to increase in dopamine GFR, increase in renal blood flow, as well as uh, natural receptors. And in uh, a five to and in dose of five to ten microgram per kg per minute, this is predominant beta one action. Apart from the action um, uh, dopamine, that leads to intense uh, beta one action leads to anotropic effect. In this is called perfusion. In this is heart rate. In this is the cardiac output. And at higher doses, that is more than ten mics per kg per minute, the alpha action predominates. Alpha action predominates doesn't mean that the, the, the effect is not having any action on beta one. The, the only, it only means that the action on alpha predominates over beta 1 as well as uh, dopamine. So, uh, if you give at an alpha dose of more than 10 mics per kg per minute, the alpha action predominates, leading to an increase in system loss resistance as well as increase in venous system. So, you might have heard about the renal dose of dopamine. This is uh, frequently asked for your uh, uh, theory exam, uh, your, uh, your opinion about the renal dose of dopamine. As well as for a bacterial like exams also, so renal dose of uh, dopamine. What is renal dose of dopamine? Renal dose of dopamine means a low dose of dopamine that is one to three mics per kg per kg per minute. It will increase the renal blood flow. It will lead to an increase in natriuresis as well as diuresis. That is that is that concept is known as the renal dose of dopamine. It's the low dose of dopamine which leads to an increase in renal blood flow as well as natriuresis as well as diuresis. And the drop. Uh, whether this uh, renal dose of dopamine is relevant in our practice, it's mainly uh, significant in our uh, with our ICU patients. Uh, but 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 what is the current role of uh, dopamine as a renal protective drug? The answer is uh, dopamine's effect based on dose alone is unpredictable. That just means that uh, if you are giving a uh, dopamine at a dose of 12 mics per kg per minute, you cannot say that here uh, the patient is getting the dose at a particular rate. Uh, the patient will be having alpha one immediate effect. These dose effect effects are unpredictable. They are not. Uh, they are not predictable as the textbook states. And second one is the, the dopamine has got an unproven beneficial effects on uh, renal function. It is, it is not associated with an improved in you not improvement in uh, creatine clearance or uh, there is uh, any significant improvement in uh, renal function or in decreased rates of hemodialysis. And there is no evidence that the improved you output protects the renal function. So uh, the renal dose of dopamine is actually a misnomer. It's not uh, that the term is not no longer used nowadays because of the, because of inconsistent effects on a renal function, and it's not associated with improving the improvement in renal function or uh, decreasing the rates of hemodialysis. That is the answer for uh, your, the uh, renal 
windows of dopamine by effects of windows of dopamine so what is the action of for dopamine on respiratory system dopamine interferes with the ventilatory response to the arterial hypoxemia and hypercapnia leading to the depression of ventilation i am mentioning only the important points uh, the prototype drug adrenal we have covered almost all the aspects of adrenal and uh, uh, with the, with, uh, when we are going to dealing with the other drugs we are uh, dealing only with the important points so uh, dopamine can because the depression of ventilation by altering the ventilatory response to arterial hypoxemia and hypercapnia also it can uh, change the ventilation perfusion matching uh leading to arterial desaturation which is also associated with increase in the pulmonary capillary system so what are ultimately what are the uses of the dopamine dopamine is uh, used in uh, mainly uh, two situations previously it was used in this in a number of conditions but because of uh, its side effects and uh, um, unproven effects uh, it's used in only in uh, two conditions one is the condition associated with the um vasodilatation and uh, one, and one associated with the reduction the cardiac uh, cardiac output only two conditions we are using uh, dopamine uh, first one is severe congestive cardiac failure especially patients with oliguria and uh, uh, with the low left vascular systems and uh, it so maybe it's also can be also concerned in patients with cardiac as well as the septic shock but uh, in cardiac shock i will come to that later okay uh, so uh, in patients with a cardiac failure you can consider dopamine as well as for as well as in patients with cardiac shock as well as in, uh, septic shock especially if the patient is having bradycardia because it's associated with the increase in heart rate so what are the adverse effects associated with the dopamine dopamine associated with a, a number of side effects as nausea vomiting tachycardia and general pain variety of arrhythmias headache hypertension and peripheral vascular constriction uh, may should be encountered during dopamine infusion and extravasation as with all other catecholamine and catecholamine catecholamine uh, is associated with the extravasation extravasation will cause the ischemic necrosis as well as swelling of the uh, tissues of uh, tissues where necrosis uh, extravasation has occurred and what about dobutamine dobutamine is a synthetic synthetic uh, catecholamine dopamine was a natural catecholamine dobutamine is a synthetic catecholamine it's a directly acting synthetic catecholamine with a predominant effect on beta 2 beta 1 and a minor effect on uh, Uh, minor effect on uh, 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 um, beta 2. Predominant effect is on uh, beta 1, so its action will be increasing the cardiac contractility as well as in the heart rate. With the mind, it has got a minor effect on beta 2, that is, plus a dilatory effect is there. So it will increase the contractility, will increase the heart rate, and there is a fall. There could be a fall in muscle resistance, uh, which can, which can uh, favor an increase and in which can uh, augment the cardiac output. So, increase in contractility along with a fall in system of resistance. That is why it is called as an ionodilator. Increase in contractility as well as fall in system of resistance. It is available as 5 ml ampules containing 50 mg per ml. Uh, even though um, falling SPR is uh, can be uh, is anticipated, BP usually remains unchanged, and the dose is 520 microgram per kilogram per ml. Here we can see the action of um, uh, dobutamine on. Uh, Uh, action on of uh, uh, dopamine on uh, CBS in uh, patients with the normal cardiac contractility, you can see with the uh, uh, with the dopamine there is a there is uh, sorry uh, with the dopamine you can see uh, there is increase in diastolic there is increase in diastolic BP with the dopamine uh, diastolic BP also and uh, increase in the uh, heart rate heart rate increase in heart rate at the same time uh, the the cardiac output also increases. But the systemic vascular resistance falls. But the BPs, the systemic vascular resistance falls. But the BP is maintained by increasing the cardiac impact. This is patient. This is an A subservient patient with the normal uh, cardiac contractility. But what happens in patients with an abnormal cardiac contractility or patients with poor cardiac function? The heart rate will go go high, and the same uh, the the systemic the systemic BP will increase to a certain extent. And after reaching a particular point, after reaching a particular threshold, it will start dropping. And similarly, diastolic BP will initially increase, and after reaching particular cardiac contractility, it cannot increase the cardiac index further, and it will, the cardiac index will fall as well as the uh, uh, cardiac output will fall as well as the diastolic BP will fall because of the fall in systemic vascular resistance. That is why you should be very careful in patients who are having hypotension. Whenever you are using the butamine, if the patient is having hypotension, you should be careful. In that case, what you can do is you can uh, you can uh, combine the butamine uh, with the vasopressors like a uh, dopamine or an oratorinaline to uh, to 
offset the uh, beta 2 agonistic action. So, what are the uses of uh, dobutamine? Dobutamine is used similarly, uh, similar, similar to dopamine. Dobutamine is used as a, for a short term treatment of the cardiac decompensation that can occur for cardiac surgery. In urgent patients with the cardiac, fail, cardiac failure because of uh, myocardial infarction, so the common indications for dobutamine and it is, uh, can be used for a specific cardiography because uh, um, uh, it's a pharmacodynamic properties include increase in cardiac and cardiac as well as it causes an increase in myocardial oxygen demand. So that can be used to, uh, for uh, cardiac express cardiography. In uh, sepsis patient, as you, as you know, there is uh, some degree of myocardial dysfunction is there. Uh, since certain patients with uh, septic shock, if they oxygen, if you feel that the patient is not improving the oxygen extraction, they will use low. And if you feel that the reduced cardiac output is responsible for uh, this, uh, this problem, then you can try the vitamin to increase the cardiac output to uh, supernormal status. That's the role of the vitamin in septic. There are certain contraindications for the use of the vitamin. That is the first one is a dynamic intermediate obsession. That's seen with the left ventricular hypertrophy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Also, in certain kind of uh, cardiomyopathy, such as you may have heard about tachycardia cardiomyopathy. In this kind of conditions, you should be very careful whenever you are using the uh, butamine. A variety of uh, adverse effects are also found uh, with uh, whenever you are using, using the butamine, like uh, different kinds of arrhythmia. Some textbooks say the butamine is more arrhythmogenic than a coffee. Then hypotension because of uh, effect on uh, beta 2, increase the myocardial oxygen uh, requirement. It can increase, uh, it can inhibit the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, and long term use uh, has been uh, associated with the negative moment. And next one is uh, isoprenaline. Isoprenaline is uh, was previously used for uh, um, symptomatic bradycardia. Nowadays, isoprenaline is not so commonly used, but uh, you have to learn the pharmacology of, uh, of isoprenaline for the isoprenaline. It's a synthetic catecholamine. It's a non-selective beta agonist. That is, uh, it acts on both beta 1 as well as beta 2 with no action on my part. It has got a strong anotropic as, as well as chronotropic action. And the cardiac output is increased. Uh, and uh, because of um, uh, the beta 2 action, the peripheral vascular resistance is reduced. The actual BP is reduced and they may be usually false. Usually they may be false. And it relaxes almost all smooth muscles, the wrong smooth muscles, CAD smooth muscles. And it's used to include a complete heart block asthma, the process three points is uh, uh, isoprenaline has been uh, it's, uh, available in uh, uh, ambulance and the administration uh, include um, IV infusion and the dose is 0.5 to 0.5 microgram per week. And uh, so isoprenaline is associated with this from uh, uh, beta 1 agonist, so it's associated with tachycardia, palpitations, angina, dysrhythmia, hypotension, and sweating because of its uh, mainly because of its beta 1. This is a graph showing, uh, comparing the effects of noradrenaline with the uh, isoprenaline. Here you can um, see one thing. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can see here noradrenaline is associated with the uh, noradrenaline is associated with the uh, increase in systolic BP, increase in diastolic BP, as well as increase in um, mean BP. And the reflex cardiac can occur with the noradrenaline. Whereas with the isoprenaline. There is increase in systolic BP, uh, but uh, uh, there is diastolic BP usually falls and mean BP usually, uh, mean BP also uh, uh, usually falls. So diastolic BP falls, the systolic BP increases slightly and then it remains also the diastolic BP falls and the mean BP also falls. And there is an increase in uh, heart rate. This is the compar uh, comparison between the actions of cardiovascular actions of norepinephrine as well as the isoprenaline. So overall, uh, we'll uh, compare the uh, actions on uh, different receptors by different uh, agents. Uh, uh, adrenaline, as you can uh, see here, uh, adrenaline is as good as non-selective, uh, sort of selective agonist of all the receptors. It has got action on alpha 1, it has got action on beta 1, beta 2, and no actions on uh, dopamine and the vasopus. Whereas uh, noradrenaline, it has got selective actions on alpha, alpha 1. Selective actions on alpha, and some actions on uh, beta, uh, some actions on beta one action, beta one action is also there with no action on beta two. That is why uh, hypertension can occur with the low dose of adrenaline, whereas with noradrenaline, no hypertension is usually observed. Dopamine acts on uh, dose dependent action is there. Uh, along with that, there is uh, action on dopamine and no actions on muscle. 
uh, it's a new moderate doses um uh, moderate doses high doses uh, alpha one beta reaction for dopamine so long beta one action and the uh, actions from dopamine that suppress it also beta so beta mean the main action is on uh, beta one receptor with the mild actions on uh, beta two with the mild actions on alpha one isoprenaline does it is a non selective beta agonist with the uh, actions on both i beta one as well as beta two phenylephrine is associated with the uh, alpha one action pure is a pure uh, uh, vasoconstrictor uh, is acts so it's a gas word action from alpha one and the builder one does not have any actions on the receptor is vasopressin action on uh, vasopressin receptor so before going to the other drugs uh, we should know how uh, this uh, how to dilute this drugs how to give this drugs uh, in our icu or uh, during our career practice practice before going to that let me tell you something there is no widely accepted or universally accepted formula for calculating the dose for dilution every institution has got their own protocol and formula for dilution uh, and the most of the modern hospitals what they do is that they they will either use the help of the uh, they had the, the, the sort of the uh, help of the software so where you have to uh, give the input that's the weight as well as the required drug uh, dosages and the software will automatically calculate the rate of infusion but for the uh, example for example on the few you have to know about a certain formula that can help you to uh, dilute the drug one is uh, rule of rule of 6 this is the uh, this is the uh, rule of 6 um, that is that means if you multiply the body weight by 6 you will get a particular uh, drug dosage and you dilute in 100 ml uh, but if we usually dilute the drug in ICs we usually dilute the drugs in uh, 50 ml that uh, that that then with that means we can half the as uh, so it's into 3 that is 3 times the body weight if you take a 3 times the body weight drug and dilute in 50 ml uh, solution if you run that solution that 1 m 1 ml per hour uh, will give you 1 microgram per kilogram per minute of infusion drug infusion for example if your patient weighs are about 50 kg and you multiply with the 3 you get a 150 mg so for example uh, dopamine you take dopamine 150 mg you know that uh, each ampule of dopamine will contain 200 mg of dopamine and if you take dopamine and you dilute in uh, 50 ml and uh, if you uh, uh, in, uh, in 50 ml and if you give to the patient and as a 1 ml per hour that will be uh, equal to 1 microgram per kilogram per minute that is the rule of 3 that is 3 into body weight you dilute in 50 ml uh, of uh, saline or hydroxychloroquine and uh, you infuse uh, then the dilution will be 1 ml per hour will be equal to 1 microgram per kg per hour and then the second uh, formula is the rule of 3 rule of 3 means you take 3 mg of any drug and dilute in total volume of 50 ml uh, in that case uh, x ml per hour is equal to x ml x microgram per ml this is not depend upon the body weight so for example if you if you take 3 mg of adrenaline and add to a total volume of 50 ml 1 ml per hour of adrenaline will be equal to 1 microgram per ml that is the rule of 3 and third one is rule of half body weight that means if you take half body weight and dilute in 50 ml and uh, you infuse uh, to the patient then 1 ml per hour will be equal to 10 microgram per kilogram per hour that is suppose uh, if the patient uh, suppose if the patient has got a body weight of um, uh, um, um, 60 kg Uh, you take the half the body weight that is 30 kg you take 30 kg and dilute in 50 ml uh, diluent then 1 ml per kg in 1 ml per hour will be equal to 10 microgram per kilogram per hour these are the three rules first one is rule of 6 we take it as uh, for the for the convenience we take it as 3 and next one is rule of 3 that is 3 mg of any drug and you dilute in 50 ml x ml will be equal to x microgram per this is this one is not dependent upon uh, body weight and the third one is rule of half body weight if you take half the body weight and dilute 50 ml 1 ml per hour will be uh, 1 ml per hour of infusion will be equal to 10 microgram per kilogram per hour so uh, this is about uh, um, uh, drug dilution then we have to go through some other miscellaneous drugs also such as ephedrine uh, and uh, phenylephrine ephedrine uh, is a uh, you know, i have told you is a drug having uh, mixed action that is direct action as well as indirect sympathomimetic action it's available in a, in a variety of forms such as tablets elixir nasal drops and injection most commonly we use the injection for our anesthesia practice that is 130 mg per ml of uh, ambient 
and the cardiovascular system uh, effects include increase in heart rate, BP, cardiac output, cerebral blood flow, and it will increase the myocardial oxygen consumption, and it can precipitate apnea also. So, so significant side effect. And the respiratory system, it's a respiratory stimulant, and because of the bronchodilatation, it has been con- uh, historically been used in uh, tough setup. Then uh, renal, it, it increases the renal blood flow. And about the kinetics, it is well absorbed orally. It can be given uh, IM as well as subcutaneous. And it is this is in this drug and also all the uh, other indirect drugs that they are generally not metabolized by catechol or the transferase for monoamine oxidase. That's why it's got a longer duration of action when compared to the natural catechol. But it is prone to uh, tachyphylus. That's an important point to be considered. The uses of epidermis include uh, uh, we, have, we have been using epidermis for a, a long period uh, for our uh, for managing the hypertension associated with uh, regeneration. Also, uh, in this oxidative anesthesia, also we are we have been we have, we have been using uh, epidermis for treating the hypertension with and glaucoma. Also, to treat bronchospasm, nocturnal neurosis, and narcolepsy. Uh, most common indication and most widely used for treating the hypertension associated with regeneration. Next comes the phenylephrine. The difference from uh, ephedrine is that it's a potent alpha-1 agonist. It acts only on alpha-1 uh, subtrate. No effect on beta receptor. It's a direct acting sympathomimetic drug. Ephedrine was a mixed drug, it's having mixed action. Whereas phenylephrine is a, is a direct acting sympathomimetic with the action on beta alpha-1 only. No action on beta receptors. And it will cause a rapid rise in the sphere as well as in BP because of the potent alpha-1 receptor action. Its presentation is a clear solution containing 10 mg in one number. You have to dilute it. Uh, to give bolus doses of 150 to 100 microgram IV, and uh, you can also uh, give it as infusion that is 1 to 10 microgram per minute. Can be also used as IM or succulents as uh, with, uh, ephedrine. The major serious actions include increase in SPR as well as increase in BP, but it can result in uh, reflex bradycardia, like in noradrenaline. Uh, it can also result in reflex bradycardia if it's not arrhythmogenic. It is metabolized in liver by monoamine oxidase, and duration, duration is uh, 5 10 minutes, 5 at session, and 1 hour with the IM or subcutane. Use most common route is spinal anesthesia, and uh, uh, spinal anesthesia hypertension associated with the regional anesthesia. And in GEA, uh, patient with the left to right shunt, where there is a reverse of the shunt to manage the reversal, you can use a uh, phenylif. It's also used as nasal decongestion, as a magnetic agent, and historically for the treatment of SVT with the hypertension. And uh, our uh, magic drug, uh, finally, methamphetamine is the most commonly used drug in our day to day practice. It's a drug, it's a, it's a synthetic drug. It's a drug having both alpha as well as beta technology agnostic action, both that as well as indirect action. So, both ephedrine as well as methamphetamine are, are having uh, mixed actions. The actions include a cardiac stimulant, it causes vasoconstriction, increase in systolic PP, diastolic PP, and cardiac output. It's also associated with an increase in heart, heart rate, but it's counterbalanced by the vagal stimulation. And the final uh, so heart rate will depend upon the baseline vagal uh, tone of the patient. It's available in vials containing 30 mg per ml, and the roots include IM and IV. Duration of action is 30 minutes, and IM is 6 to 120 minutes. And the uh, uh, textbook says like it's associated with a uh, significant risk of uh, CNS stimulation, such as hallucinations, convulsions, tachycardia, tremor, anxiety, fear, and psychosis. Uh, we have been using this uh, for a long period of time. We have, we have not seen any uh, CNS stimulation as the textbook says, but, uh, um, uh, but as for the literature, it's a the significant increased risk of uh, CNS stimulation. CNS and uh, certain, uh, we have to go through certain miscellaneous uh, drugs also, which are also kept for your uh, practical exams, such as vasopressin. I'll briefly go through this uh, rest of the drugs. Vasopressin, vasopressin is a hormone secreted from the pituitary. Uh, uh, it's the same, the same with the uh, ADH hormone. It acts on the vasopressin receptors. There are two types of vasopressin receptors are there. One is the V1 receptors, which is mainly present in the blood vessel, and the V2 receptors are present in the kidney. Vasopressin is a potent vasopressor when present in uh, uh, high concentration. And uh, it's mainly effective in vasodilatory shock. The, the effects include uh, the increases of BP, SPR, and uh, there is a catecholamine sparing effect that it reduces the need for uh, catecholamine. The most important and the most common uh, indication for a cat- for vasopressin is a septic shock. In sepsis, uh, there is a uh, there is an entity known as uh, relative uh, there, there is an entity uh, known as relative vasopressin deficiency. Uh, there is a uh, entity known as relative vasopressin deficiency. That is that means in the initial period of uh, sepsis, 
the patient will be having uh, liberty levels of vasopressin and uh, as a set of progress to set of talk after 4 to 8 to 72 hours the vasopressin levels will to be come back to normal levels this is uh, some uh, uh, this, this is not expected in patient with hypotension where you expect high levels of vasopressin in patient having hypotension so that is not related to vasopressin deficiency that may be the one of the reasons for the uh, for the persistence of hypotension in patient with septic shock uh, it's used to usually used as an add on to norotomy it is never a first time drug it is usually as a uh, it's been used as an add on drug to norotomy Those is uh, 0.01 to 0.03 microgram per kilogram per. You can see, you can you can observe. Um, uh, sorry, this is not uh, kg per uh, per minute infusion. Per minute infusion. This is um, uh, not depend upon the uh, uh, body weight, and it is uh, not titrate also. Uh, as with the um, uh, unlike the unlike the, with the, the other drugs, uh, this is not uh, titrate. We are using fixed drug dose, 0.01 to 0.03 units per minute infusion, and the availability in pre-filled service is available as 20 units, as plus in 40 units is available. And the adverse effect, the most important and most common side effect is fistula uh, distal ischemia as well as gangrene, exacerbation of the skin necrosis. It's also reported to cause some uh, increasing liver enzymes, also with some uh, reduction of the liver flow. And another drug. Uh, which is uh, um, uh, which is also commonly used, especially in the cardiac and such setting, is the main one. This is phosphodiesterase three inhibitor. Phosphodiesterase three inhibitor. I'm not going to detail pharmacology. Phosphodiesterase three inhibitor means it will increase the intracellular TAMP concentration. That will increase intracellular calcium concentration, increase the cardiac output because of the increase in cardiac contractility, and it's associated with the reduction in the systemic as well as the pulmonary vascular resistance. That is uh, why it is known as anodilator. Is also uh, an anode directed like the W drug. It is associated with increase in cardiac output, cardiac contractility, at the same time it is associated with the reduced adverse system as well as pulmonary vascular resistance. At the dose is uh, uh, usually given as an IV, bolus dose of 50 microgram. Uh, it's associated with um, uh, IV dosage of uh, 50 microgram um, followed by uh, over 10 minutes. Uh, 50, uh, 50 microgram followed by uh, continuous infusion of 0.375 to 0.75 microgram per kilogram per day. The problem with the uh, uh, glutamine is that this uh, IV bolus can cause hypotension. So in many of the centers, they allow this uh, IV bolus dose of glutamine, uh, and they just give the continuous infusion as the 0.375 to 0.75 mics per kg per day. Use as you know, it's the main use after cardiac surgery. Uh, used in patients with who are having cardiac decompensation after cardiac surgery, and also as a short-term treatment as well as a bridge to orthopathic heart transplantation in patients with chronic heart failure. It's never used as a long-term uh, treatment uh, option. Side effects: uh, it's hard by it having hypotension. Uh, it can produce arrhythmia. Another drug is levosimendan. Levosimendan is uh, a different class of drug. It's a calcium sensitizer or troponin. And uh, it, it's the importance of levosimendan is that it's able to improve the myocardial efficiency without causing increase in the myocardial oxygen demand. That, that means it has having a positive anotropic effect without increasing myocardial oxygen demand. And uh, it's having a vasodilatory uh, effect in the coronary systemic uh, circulation. Dose is 3 to 6 microgram per kilogram over 10 minutes, followed by 0.05 to 0.2 microgram per kilogram per minute. And uh, adverse effects include the hypotension the persistence of uh, hypovolemia, especially the persistence of hypovolemia. The uses include unresponsive cardiogenic shock, uh, as, um, uh, as you see after cardiac surgery, to restore the LBRB function after cardiac surgery, and to improve the cardiac function. Sometimes it's used to improve the cardiac function in the ARDS patient also. It is having uh, anti-inflammatory as well as anti-apoptotic effects are also present for liver system. Then uh, um, finally, I will um, uh, tell you some uh, common uh, questions that leaders are usually asked in our uh, uh, exam. So why do you want to give the central level? Why do you give the, the scatterbrain to a central level? One, one point is to prevent the extra recession. This is the uh, problem with extra recession. As you can see here, the extra recession, the tissue gangrene. As initially bulla formation will be there, yeah, initially there will be bulla formation, erythema, edema formation, that will follow the skin necrosis, skin necrosis. To prevent this, you have to give, uh, ideally through, through a central venous catheter. It's not mandatory that uh, previous test thought like you have to give all catheters through the central line. Nowadays, we know that if you give enough uh, dilution, if you can use a large gauge catheter as well as a large vein, 
can probably use a, a cathode column used through the tensor lines for a short term purpose. So, why do you want to use the center lines catheter? One is to prevent extra position. And second one is these patients are, are in shock. So, uh, you have to you know, make sure that the drug is in central circulation because the because the central circulation is sluggish. You have to make sure that the drug is in central circulation. You have to give the drug to the central circulation. And the another question is can you give the drug? Um, yeah, we have heard like uh, the issue. To dilute the drug only 5% flex cross for uh, dilution. You should not use any other um, uh, dilution for uh, dilution. Conventionally, we have been using 5% flex cross for dilution, but uh, there is no enough literature to, uh, to justify this. Uh, to, uh, so, to say that 5% flex cross will maintain the uh, stability of that drug and come to normal saline. And we have been using this in our normal saline for the dilution for the past five or six uh, years in our, in our own ICU without much, uh, much uh, uh, problems for any loss of you know, There is a study also show there is equal stability with using 5% flexors and normal saline. But uh, because this is an exam, and uh, since Jordan says so, you have to uh, say so in your exam. So you will be diluting the drug in 5% uh, flexors. So how can you uh, prevent the uh, drug from degradation, proper degradation? Uh, these old drugs, uh, especially at and Norentinarin, these old drugs are available also at the uh, and these old drugs are available in amber colored food. This is to prevent the photo degradation. And second one is uh, reducing it in like sodium metabolic sulfate or ascorbic acid is added to these drugs to, uh, as antioxidants to prevent oxidation. The problem with the sodium metabolic sulfate is that it can uh, provoke allergic reactions in some patients. And uh, how will you manage extra session? Suppose extra session has occurred to your patients. Unfortunately, extra session has occurred to your patients after long term infusion to a paper line. How will you manage this situation? Mm -hmm. All these drugs can cause extra session, like atinide, norotan, document, the glutamine, phenylephrine, vasopressin. All these drugs are uh, known to cause um, uh, uh, extra session. And uh, uh, one, uh, one drug is uh, especially notorious. Norotanol, especially notorious to produce. Uh, extra was and my extra was like both plus the last person is also how will you manage the situation? We have got a non pharmacological methods as well as the pharmacological methods are available. Non pharmacological methods uh, are uh, more important than compared to the pharmacological methods. That's first of all, so you have to stop the infusion, you have to retain the cannula, and uh, you can try to aspirate any residual drug in the cannula. Also, you can uh, irrigate the affected limb and you can give bond compresses. And uh, uh, pharmacological methods include the injection of endolamine in a slate that doses 5 to 10 milligrams in 10 ml of normal saline. You can inject in the local area, but it's effective only up to 12 hours after the extra session happens. Uh, everybody knows about the uh, how to manage uh, hypertension region anesthesia, but the mechanics of uh, hypertension region anesthesia, how to manage it. I'm not going to the details because the uh, 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 time is uh, too late. Uh, the management technically uh, includes uh, the use of IV fluids and the vasopressors are the best uh, treatment. Because how, how much fluid you, uh, you give to the intravascular uh, compartment, you have to do some vasopressors also. Because the main, uh, the main physiology based of the machine is traction resistant vascular resistance. So you can try to use drugs like epitome, penelephrine, metformin, or nowadays, norotonin has also been investigated as a drug for treatment of hypertension susceptibility to regionalization. Also in obstetric anesthesia, there has been we have been using epitrin, phenylephrine, as well as uh, for a long period of time. Uh, um, uh, there was always a controversy whether epitrin or phenylephrine was, uh, uh, was uh, having a more favorable outcome in uh, a bit as well as whether uh, um, uh, when you are giving up to hydrate the hypothesis with the um, uh, And uh, uh, last year, um, uh, a mechanism has come in the treatment of anesthesia. They have examined this in detail. And they found out that the epitome associated was associated with the uh, bad outcome, bad teeth outcome in the form of a reduction in medical arterial pH as well as reduction in the metabolic resources as well as uh, increasing the fetal uh, PCO2 because of the direct action of the uh, fetal metabolism. Septic shock, uh, the most important drug, uh, the drug of choice is normal, you all, may, all might be knowing. Because it's associated with the mortality benefit and as well as the loss, uh, low risk of arrhythmia. So, norotonin is the drug of choice in that uh, You can consider, um, uh, previously we have been using uh, dopamine for the treatment of septic shock, but it's associated with more tachycardia and it's more arrhythmogenic when compared to the uh, norotonin. And uh, uh, it may be considered in patients who are having a compromised system function. Adrenaline is not used only in uh, 
are emergency situations uh, because of its deleterious effect on uh, the patient, cardiac system, other, other metabolic effects. In vasopressin, um, it also has got a role in the treatment of the septic shock. As a body, it's associated with septic processing, which is vasopressin deficiency. It can be used as an add-on agent, as a catechotomy sparing agent in, uh, in septic shock. Phenylephrine, there's a diatase first, uh, but we hope uh, more and more trials come in favor of uh, and in the cardiogenic shock, uh, vasopressors and inotropes uh, have, uh, are used to improve the vasopressors are mainly used to improve the MAP and used to improve the tissue perfusion. And the inotropes are used to use as a cardiac output, and but these are associated with the increase in the heart rate. So you can use in cardiogenic shock, you can use both vasopressors as well as uh, inotropes, but that, that should be used in the minimum dose of the minimum possible uh, time period. The glutamine appears to be an ideal agent because it increases the cardiac output. At the same time, um, it is associated with the anodilate reaction, it improves the cardiac output. But uh, that will become a because cardiac failure uh, national registry shows an increase in mortality associated with the uh, One another option, important option is norotinine. Norotinine is associated with the is a vasoconstriction associated with the increase in BP, stroke and the cardiac output factor either unchanged or reduced. Nowadays, norotinine has come up as the uh, important. Uh, main drug of choice for the treatment of uh, cardiogenic shock. Dopamine is not used because of a high mortality. Milton can be uh, considered because of the uh, no direct effect, there is a chance of this increase of new onset atrial fibrillation as well as hypertension. Because the mandan, uh, there is no advantage, pilots, so there is no advantage of using the reverse mandan over the liver. In uh, hypovolemic shock, obviously, we know the polio resuscitation and the sort of control of the soul, these are the most important things to be done in a hypovolemic shock. But it's also important to maintain the tissue perfusion in hopes that uh, the tissue perfusion is not compromised. So, uh, in, for that, you can use the vasopressors uh, to maintain the uh, uh, mean arterial pressure in hypovolemic shock. Also, in, in the initial period of hypovolemic shock, there is a um, sympathetic or, or our active will be there that will maintain the mean arterial pressure. But at the, uh, after uh, some time, the sympathetic system will get exhausted. So the blood vessels will develop a state of uh, sympathetic non-response which is also known as vasoplegia. In that case, vasopressin vasopressors will be uh, beneficial. The ideal drug of choice for hypovolemic shock is not clear. And, if, uh, and finally, about uh, anaphylactic shock, we have already discussed that means drug of choice. And finally, about uh, neurogenic shock. After spinal cord injury, you get a uh, type of neurogenic shock associated with hypotension and the bradycardia. And hypotension can cause ischemia to the spinal cord, uh, create a vicious cycle. And the vasopressor uh, of choice depends upon the level of injury. Higher the uh, level of injury means higher means high, high in the cervical spine, or up to the level of T6, so you, you know that the cardiac fibers, active fibers, or the T1, T4, you need a vasoactive agent for both vasopressor action as well as anatropic action. But when it comes to a lower level of injury, uh, only a pure vasoconstriction like a phenylephrine may be. So, um, uh, for your exam point of view, when uh, you are given with a threat it, during your viva, you are supposed to uh, uh, tell, uh, you're supposed to answer all these aspects of a threat. Like, then you have to tell about the name of the threat, the chemical classification, the result of action, its preparation, availability, different actions, the root of transmission, pharmacokinetic, various uses, uh, dosage, side effects, contraindications. These are the headings under which you should answer when you get a question like when you get a threat during your viva. You are supposed to answer all these uh, um, uh, all this under this heading. So finally, some general points uh, before concluding the session, some general points I would like to tell. Uh, most importantly, this is to be taken as a, a, a take home message. The inotropes increase the cardiac output. The mean arterial pressure will usually increase as a second treatment, whereas fossil constrictors will increase the mean arterial pressure and increase the cardiac output. Fluid resuscitation should precede the start of cardiac support in the presence of hypovolemia. In hypovolemia, always try to correct the fluid volume uh, deficit, but simultaneously, you can start the vasopressors to maintain the mean arterial pressure. Uh, it should be preferably given as an IV infusion, except the atrium. Atrium can be given as a multiple other route, all other drugs given as IV infusion only. These drugs are having a very fast onset of action and a very short duration of action. And you have to use centrally catheter, preferably for the infusion. But for short time period during an emergency, you can uh, consider giving this drug to a white core cannula and a large core cannula. And the titration should be slow. That means uh, this drugs will take some time to get to reach the equilibrium state. Now, 
also if you, you do a fast titration that can cause an overshooting of the pp or hypotension so the titration should be slow that means you can titrate um, uh, with an interval of 5 to 10 minutes only not faster than that also if if you give a prolonged infusion of this beta cell this uh, this uh, and also this catecholamine that causes a down regulation of the beta receptors and you may have increased infusion rate after some time that doesn't mean that the patient's condition has become bad because of a down regulation of the beta receptors also you just don't give this uh, that drug blindly without any uh, specific endpoints so always have to try to specific endpoints you have to uh, decide upon the uh, decide upon the endpoints that's um, and it may be 70 mm of mercury and uh, uh, it can be it can be uh, can be targeted a higher mmp may be needed in patients who are having chronic hypertension or a patient with ckd or a recent surgical impact also in trauma patients a lower mmp may be targeted and the bleeding source is concerned also these drugs are incompatible with alkaline solutions like a sort of a drug and throwing in the person it should be combined with these drugs also there is a basic chance of extra session and peripheral skin is always there So monitor for these complications whenever this patient is on long term uh, infusion of these drugs. Like you said, all these drugs are atmogenic and uh, can cause myocardial ischemia. You have to monitor for this cause. And before thinking about dinotrophs and vasopressors, always search for the cause of hypotension and treat simultaneously. Give me that slide. That ends my presentation. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Dr. Anuraj, uh, for the excellent tutoring on uh, dinotrophs and vasopressors. uh can you see the questions on the chat box uh, before going to the question and answer sessions a uh, couple of announcements uh, i invite dr chakrao for his announcement and once again reminding of the next week's topics that's the basics of local anesthesia and local anesthetics by professor balabaskar and uh, hypothermic intraperitoneal insufflation of chemotherapy take agents by professor garg so Dr. Chakrao. Hello. Yeah, please. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, actually, it's a real honor. Uh, we have made a wonderful, detailed talk, and uh, I'm very happy. Uh, this is part of the CPR. The, your talk, <laughs> the drugs which are you, <laughs> which we use. Uh, you're all talking, but you have given a very, very extensive and detailed description of each drug. and uh, i'm i'm excellent uh, it is excellent i am very happy thank you very much and uh, of course uh, tomorrow we have a tot if anybody wants to join uh, they can join we don't want to charge any, anything uh, we, I, i'll send a, i have already sent a link to binil machu they can join and uh, here it, it starts at 9 o'clock and uh, the <clears throat> the ceo and director of uh, the Uh, national boards is attending as the chief guest uh, he will inaugurate at 9 and uh, all the other uh, this faculty will be giving a lecture on the indian resuscitation guidelines and uh, please please uh, see how indian resuscitation guidelines please attend um, um, the link is with uh, vinil match thank, thank you. you sir thank you sir we will be um, circulating the link in our uh, whatsapp groups yes, especially in the pg everybody let everybody know what is what is the uh, irc <laughs> thank you very much i request the post graduates uh, uh, about to appear for the practical exams to attend the session because uh, anyway the cpr sessions should be there as a station so it would be better for them to attend the uh, tomorrow session only four hour session okay thank you sir good uh, uh, dr anurag uh, would you like to uh, take questions it was an excellent presentation dr anjali thank you okay can you first see the question in the chat box yes uh, i think the first question is um, when to start vasopressin in septic shock vasopressin uh, the 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 problem with the vasopressin is uh, vasopressin is uh, never a first entry in septic shock Uh, studies with the uh, vasopressin that is a uh, two major studies that uh, were like uh, the vast trial the vanish trial they did not show an improvement in mortality with the uh, use of vasopressin uh, so but but vasopressin has got an excellent effect of uh, catecholamine sparing effect is there catecholamine sparing effect is there so uh, the adrenaline is definitely going to be the first drug of choice for the septic shock 
but uh, when you feel that uh, the noradrenaline is not uh, is not uh, not effective that you are not able to do the uh, bb with the use of uh, noradrenaline alone uh, you can uh, probably start thinking about adding noradrenaline but uh, most of the centers do is that they start with a a uh, lot of uh, noradrenaline and when the dose uh, exceeds a 10 ml per hour the, they will usually add uh, vasopressin but uh, i don't think there is any specific guideline for uh, the threshold for adding vasopressin usually added when uh, uh, noradrenaline uh, the, the level uh, exceeds 10 ml per hour second uh, question is compare uh, and elaborate on vasopressin options For certain patients, uh, you have to think about uh, the fetal outcome as well as the maternal outcome. Um, you have to maintain both the fetal uh, well-being as well as the maternal <coughs> cardiac output. We have been using um, traditionally we have been using ephedrine, phenylephrine as well as methamphetamine for this uh, for purpose. purpose. Um, in, in, in most of the literatures, they have a compared ephedrine as well as um, phenylephrine. Ephedrine is also to increase in BP as well as increase in Uh, heart rate. There are uh, phenylephrine associated with uh, phenylephrine is pure vasopressin that is uh, that can cause increases in BP as well as it reflects body cardiac. So um, from the maternal uh, maternal perspective, uh, uh, when you take when you compare ephedrine with uh, uh, phenylephrine, if the patient is having a body cardiac, you cannot use phenylephrine. You can use only uh, ephedrine. Uh, but uh, if the patient uh, the patient is having an adequate uh, heart rate, enough uh, heart rate, then you can probably think about uh, giving phenylephrine. This was the concept, but uh, last year, um, uh, the meta-analysis was published in the British Journal of Nutrition. I already mentioned they have directly compared uh, directly compared um, this uh, effects of phenylephrine, ephedrine, and methamphetamine as well as noradrenaline on mother as well as the fetal well-being. Uh, they have used uh, the, the fetal umbilical arterial pH as well as uh, basis as well as uh, PCOD. Uh, to see what is the effect of this effects on the fetal well-being, but they found the found the is uh, that uh, ephedrine is the most dangerous drug, the most dangerous drug because it is it is directly acting on the fetal circulation, the fetal um, metabolism, it causes the fetal metabolism, and it which is associated with the reduction of the pH, it is associated with the uh, increase in base excess as well as increase in uh, fetal uh, PCOD. So they have uh, um, suggested like uh, uh, you can go for uh, either methamphetamine. Uh, or phenylephrine as a first vasopressor choice in uh, obstetric patients. They have also considered the use of uh, not only them but um, a number of um, uh, trials have come have, uh, have assessed the use of uh, have examined the use of norepinephrine. And norepinephrine is coming as uh, coming out as a promising drug for the treatment as well as the prophylaxis of hypertension, especially in obstetric patients. It is not associated with the uh, reduction in the uh, uterine artery blood flow. Uh, but uh, at, at present, the data uh, is spares to recommend norepinephrine as a drug of choice for treating the hypotension. You can consider either phenylephrine or methamphetamine as a treatment hypotension option. Okay, uh, it is important so priming the pressure lines before starting the uh, uh, infusion. Um, the vaso, as far as vaso pressures and uh, um, uh, Uh, vasopressin and nitrops are considered. Uh, considered, there is no uh, no point in uh, priming the lines because they are not. Uh, they don't do not get attached to the um, plastic tubings uh, like the vasodilators. Uh, so we just have to um, flush out the lines uh, before starting the infusion. Don't have to. There is no. Uh, uh, I don't think you have to prime the lines. Uh, why noradrenaline is preferred over dobutamine cardiogenic shock? Dobutamine appears to be the drug of choice for the uh, treatment of uh, cardiac arrest shock because it's associated with an inhibitor. It is uh, it increases the cardiac output, increases the heart rate. Uh, uh, at the same time, it's associated with the vasodilatation, so that will augment the cardiac output. This is the uh, theoretical aspect of using dobutamine, but it's associated with the increased risk of uh, myocardial infarction. It increases the myocardial oxygen consumption. That can adversely you can you know that the most common cause of cardiogenic shock is acute left ventricular failure secondary to um, um, acute myocardial infarction. So in such kind of patients, if you increase the myocardial oxygen consumption, that will adversely affect the uh, myocardial function of these patients. They will uh, they, they will worsen the cardiac failure. That's one of the points. The second thing is that uh, the, the uh, many trials have addressed the dobutamine uh, for the treatment of cardiogenic shock. And uh, one national registry is that there is a group that determines the heart failure national registry. They have examined this uh, um, the use of the dobutamine, but they have found out is that it's associated with increased risk of tachycardia, such as the um, it's associated with increased risk of mortality. So uh, that's why they are not um, uh, preferred nowadays in cardiogenic. 
the next one. At the same time, noradrenaline uh, without significant beta-1 activity is having um, alpha-1 activity action. It is not associated with a significant increase of, of uh, uh, myocardial, increasing the myocardial oxygen consumption. It is by virtue of its action on alpha-1, it increases the BP. It improves the uh, perfusion to the vital organs. Uh, and uh, uh, so nowadays, uh, noradrenaline is preferred over the glutamine for the treatment of cardiac issues. And there are no further questions in the chat box. Yeah, I think that uh, completes the questions uh, and sessions. So, if no more questions, uh, we'll wind up the session. I will, uh, Dr. Benil, for uh, Thank some you. concluding remarks. Remarks, Thank uh, you. Dr. Anudaj, uh, once again, it was an excellent tutoring. Uh, this session will be in the YouTube and uh, I'm sure that it will be a reference uh, format for the postgraduates to prepare for the other practical exams. Excellent one. Thank you. Over to Dr. Bidin. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rajesh, sir, for the excellent session. And thank you, Dr. Anuraj, for the, the excellent presentation. Anuraj, I will take you as uh, one of our speakers on the form quality of uh, CPR drugs. <laughs> you have to accept. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so it's a great appreciation from the IRC and uh, I thank all the seniors who attended today's uh, webinar, uh, especially a past national president and IRC chairman, Dr. Chakra Rao, and uh, many more, many GC members, Dr. Kiran Gera attended and uh, our past national secretary, Dr. Bhimeshwar attended. So many leaders attended today's oh, We are always with you. The thing is, I am... Uh, for tomorrow, I'm doing something otherwise. I would have joined on the first track itself. <laughs> and uh, I extend my sincere thanks to today's speakers. Dr. Anitaj did a very good job. And also our president, uh, state president, Dr. Abdul Nasser, uh, for his excellent presentation on the erector spinae block. Actually, we called uh, uh, Nasser sir at 4 p.m. And after that, he prepared that uh, lecture. It was an excellent lecture, and I thank him for saving us because, due to some unavoidable reasons, our speaker, Dr. Sachin, couldn't attend today's function. Actually, he got admitted in the hospital. That's oh why he, he couldn't uh, uh, give his lecture to us. And I extend my sincere thanks to our coordinators, Dr. Rajesh Shamsi and Dr. Vijish Menagopal, for organizing today's program. Extend my sincere thanks to all the participants who attended, including all the senior teachers, HODs. Uh, I could see Chitura sir here and many seniors here. Uh, uh, so I thank all the seniors and all the participants and PG students attended today's program. Thank you and good night. Good night. Dr. Anuraj, uh, Dr. Shandi insisted.